I think, I suspect many of you joining today um, are already familiar with Safe and Sound, but some may not be. Um, so I'm just going to give you the quick, uh, quick version of who we are and what we do. Um, we are a regional environmental nonprofit, uh, leading on environmental action across the entire Long Island Sound region. So Connecticut, Westchester County, New York City, Long Island. Uh, we fight climate change, work to save endangered lands, protect the sound and rivers, and use nature to restore ecosystems in a uh, very holistic uh, way. Uh, what makes us unique among nonprofits in our region is the breadth of our tools. Um, we use everything from um, legal negotiation and litigation where necessary, to uh, lobbying and advocacy, as well as on the ground work like water quality data collection and removing dams for fish passage. Um, and we, re we have been doing that for over 40 years in the region, um, and it is people like all of you who make it possible, so thank you. Um, if you would like longer term to uh, stay in close touch with Save the Sound, you are more than welcome to join our email list. If you're not already on it, you can sign up for that at savethesound.org. And we would also love to have you as a member. Um, our programs like the one today are free and open to the public, um, but it's really members um, and foundations and, and other generous people who make all of our work possible. Um, so if you are so moved and able, we welcome anything you are able to give today, which you can do easily online at savethesound.org. Um, so with that, um, I think the other, other last of housekeeping note I wanted to give was about Q&A. Um, as I said, we will have time for that towards the end. If folks have questions that arise while our presenters are speaking, you can put those in the chat. There should be at the bottom of each of your screens a little button that says chat. You can just hit that. Um, once we get into uh, the live Q&A, the easiest thing to do will be to use the raise your hand function, um, which you can also you will also find in the chat. If you open that up, there'll be a little or some some icons there, and there's a little little yellow hand that will be able to see and call on you. Um, I believe that is it. So we will just dive right in. Um, we are lucky enough today to have um, three experts with us. Uh, Tracy Babbage will be speaking largely to air quality data, Dr. Mark Mitchell will be speaking largely to health and environmental justice, and Charles Rothenberg will be speaking largely to long-term climate and health um, solutions for our region. Um, that said, all of those things are obviously interconnected, which is why, are we, why we are having all three of them on today. Um, I'm going to introduce, so that you don't have to listen to me talk too much longer, I am going to introduce each of them right before they speak. Um, so I'll let you know about Tracy right now, and then we will introduce you to Mark and Charles a little later on. Um, so Tracy Babbage uh, currently serves as the Bureau Chief for the Bureau of Air Management at the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, which implements a variety of programs to achieve clean air and ensure radiation safety across the state. She was previously the Bureau Chief for Energy and Technology Policy, where she worked on comprehensive energy and climate change planning, integrated resource planning and advancing deployment of both grid scale and distributed resources. She's now working on issues at the intersection of clean air and clean energy policies, uh, which is exactly what we'll be discussing today, among other things, as part of an integrated approach to advance the department's efforts in both of those areas. Uh, she also has previously, before, before, even before DEEP was DEEP, she worked with the Department of Environmental Protection in Connecticut, and prior to that, state service, Tracy worked on the federal level for the environmental crime section of the U.S. Department of Justice. She holds a law degree from Quinnipiac School of Law and a BA from Providence College, and she is also a member of the Connecticut Bar. So thank you very much for joining us today, Tracy. And if you would like to share your screen, you can go ahead and do so. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's so great. Great to be here, and thank you to all of you who are joining on a beautiful Friday afternoon. I'm truly flattered, um, but really excited about this conversation. I think it's important, and thank you uh, to Save the Sound for teeing this up. Um, as Laura mentioned, I'm going to get into some detail on uh, some of our air quality data and what we've been uh, looking at as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. 
um, some really interesting findings and really important for us here in Connecticut, especially since um, we suffer from some of the worst air quality in the country, especially along our, our congested transportation corridors. And, um, you know, as we, as we get deeper into this discussion, it really is a concern when we talk about acute and chronic respiratory uh, issues such as asthma. And another thing we continue to be concerned about is uh, where our cities rank in terms of asthma rates uh, across the country. So um, I'm going to get into some detail and share some of the information, both uh, what we've gathered from satellite data, which is pretty interesting, as well as some details from our air quality network. But before I do that, I want to set the stage a little bit um, and talk a little bit about um, the, 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 the impacts uh, related to COVID-19. So um, beginning in mid-March, um, as, as everyone knows, we, we've taken some unprecedented step, steps as a state and across the country, uh, really around uh, precautionary measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So um, as part of the Stay 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 Home initiative um, and the directive from the governor, immediately what we saw here in Connecticut, regionally and across the country, immediately there are fewer cars on the roads, fewer airplanes in the sky, and basically businesses and non-essential commercial activity was virtually halted. So what I'm gonna go through for you is, well, what has this meant for Connecticut and emissions and air quality in the state? So I'm gonna start with a little bit of background. Um, and I, you know, this diagram is really complicated in some ways, but in other ways, it really sets the stage for the other speakers and when we get into talking about some of the strategies. So I wanted to start with, well, let's talk a little bit about air pollution and the sources of air pollution. Some of them are obvious. Uh, transportation, if, for example, almost 40% of our emissions here in the state um, also, folks are familiar, I'm sure, with industrial sources such as power plants, but there are also emissions from aircraft, um, other categories which we refer to as area sources, which are really, uh, high, so some are highlighted in those uh, yellow boxes, but basically uh, there are sources that basically don't have a, a stack from which emissions are um, uh, from which emissions come, but you know, cumulatively, when you look at these small sources combined together, they are um, making significant uh, contributions to both from an air quality and and in terms of climate change. Um, we also are impacted by uh, biomass and wildfires, and in many cases, emissions that are coming from pretty far away. Um, so what I wanted to highlight, and you know, as part of this, we are also impacted by long-range transport and, and uh, emissions from power plants and other sources in other states. So we do spend a lot of our time working regionally. A lot of the strategies, you know, when we, when we get into the strategy discussion, it's really important that we work with our, our neighboring states and also here in Connecticut, we've done a ton of work, and a lot of it has been uh, in the litigation mode, but addressing emissions from, uh, from out-of-state sources, uh, you know, particularly in the power sector, that impact our air quality here. Because all of these emissions combined together really impact um, what we're seeing in terms of air quality here in Connecticut for us as a, a downwind state. So all of this is really important. All of it is complex um, in terms of the chemistry. Uh, but I, I think you know one of the one of the points I would stress is all of this matters uh, in terms of when we look at um, reductions that are needed, both in terms of air quality and climate. I think we're learning a lot as I get further into some of the science. Uh, there are interesting um, uh, chemical reactions that are occurring, but we know that uh, reductions and the strategies that we implement to reduce air pollution are making a huge difference in terms of air quality in the state. So let's talk about some of the sources of, of data that we use to evaluate emissions and especially what we're seeing, what we've seen related to uh, the pandemic. So um, We've been using this really cool satellite data. So um, what I am showing you now is just a visual of 
um, uh, a satellite from the European Space, Space Agency that collects data on several uh, chemical species. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, happening um, uh, constantly in terms of data that's collected. And, and this has been data that's been critical for us to understand sort of what's been happening and what we've utilized to really understand and, and uh, conduct the analysis I'm going to be getting into further around the COVID-19 shutdown and some of what we've been seeing. So, um, so let me show you some of the images from these satellites. Um, here, this just gives you uh, some of the pollutants that uh, we have are collecting data from from the satellite. And it seems to be, oh, maybe I just have to apologize for that. I think we might just have to run through it one more time before I can click forward to the next uh, slide. So there you go, very beautiful. Let's see if we can, oh. I don't know why this is okay. Here we go. So, um, so imagery from the satellite data. So, what I'm showing you basically is the I-95 corridor. And, and what I'm, I'm, you know, I, I want to point out is this is basically concentrations from the month of March over uh, from the period 2015 to 2019. It shows you the average. So when I click this, you're gonna be able to see all along the I-95 corridor, the dis distinction and the reduction that uh, we're experiencing as a result of the COVID. So if you take a look at this, you could just see dramatically the types of reduction, upwards of 30 to 40% along the corridor. So I, I'm gonna show you basically the same data, but from a different view. We're gonna zero in a little bit more to talk about um, the New York uh, City and uh, metropolitan area, including Connecticut. So this is taking you through 2015, 2016, 17, 18, 2019. Now watch 2020. So basically what you've seen through that sequence is uh, nitrogen dioxide emissions collected through satellite data, we're zeroing in on the month of March and really focused on the, you know, stay safe, stay home. What are we seeing as a result of it? And what you see in our area is emissions drastically redu reduced to, to the point where you can see in the imagery uh, what it looks like when we reduce emissions at that scale. So really interesting sort of cool imagery that we've been able to collect from uh, the satellite data. So we use satellite data, but we're also um, operating our, our air quality monitoring network. So um, it has been uh, sort of an, an ongoing process. Uh, so from the EPA's perspective, it has been um, essential operations. So we've been conducting our, our, our running our air quality monitoring network uh, to the extent that we can uh, during the pandemic. Um, so, and, and the other thing I, I'm going to talk a little bit about is just what we're seeing in terms of traffic, because we also collect traffic data and correlate it with our air quality monitoring data. So, um, how do we track air pollution in addition to what I showed you using satellite data? Well, it's a lot of data. We collect a lot of data and we operate a statewide air quality monitoring network, which gives us real-time data. So we can actually see uh, and track and monitor exactly you know, what pollution levels we're seeing across the state in, in, near, in real time. This map just gives you a quick, we have 14 air quality monitoring stations around the, around the state and just some quick snapshots of the different stations that we operate. Um, a lot of sophisticated equipment, a lot of work that we do also um, in partnership with uh, other federal agencies, uh, EPA to, to is one, but NASA and uh, other regional uh, projects that we work on in terms of researching air quality. We also are all looking at source reporting data, so emissions from power plants as an example and other industrial processes. Um, where there's regular reporting and we have the ability uh, to make sure we're tracking exactly what's happening at a source level. And then there's other work that we're doing in terms of observations and research. Uh, one thing that's a topic for another day, 
really interesting work that's going on to really understand uh, emissions, the form, uh, formation of ozone over Long Island Sound. And we're, we're finding from that research that there, there are some unique properties around the sound that contributes to the atmospheric chemistry and ozone formation. So some great work that's been going on that has uh, been national in scope and involves a lot of research agencies. So let's talk a little bit about transportation, because one of the first things we saw um, as a result of uh, the Stay Safe, Stay Home directive was an immediate drop in uh, emissions and traffic counts uh, related to transportation. So um, this just gives you um, some data. This is collected from our uh, traffic counter on Hart Hartford in Hartford. At eight, um, I-84, so it's adjacent to a monitor that we operate, uh, which basically is evaluating emissions, what, what we call near road, to really get a, uh, a you know, impression of what's happening in terms of emissions from the transportation sector. So um, this is data that uh, we've collected and have been looking at, and you can see the average um, from January to March 13th, that what we were seeing is on the order of 169,000 vehicles per day. And then you can see the drop that occurs um, after uh, March, uh, beginning in March 14th, and it's down about 41% uh, to about 99,000 vehicles. So pretty dramatic reductions in terms of transportation counts. Um, we've been looking at that data just from both the perspective of what does it mean for weekday traffic as well as weekend traffic. This just gives you the pre and post shutdown graphs. The, pre-shutdown graph there, the line in blue, and then you can see the reduction uh, during the weekday traffic post uh, shutdown. Similar uh, types of results that we see in terms of weekend traffic. Um, again, in blue, weekend pre-shutdown, and in orange, uh, post-shutdown. So uh, pretty substantial reductions. So what has this all meant in terms of what we've seen from uh, the, pers the perspective of reducing emissions? Well, it's actually been pretty significant. Um, I'm going to put this a little bit in context. So we're showing um, just again in blue uh, the period uh, March 1st through the 13th, and then in orange uh, from the 14th through uh, April 12th. Now we continue to add to this data set. But what, you, what we're looking at here is just, you know, we're, we're capturing really just a snapshot, which shows the result of, you know, again, like I said in the very, the very first or second slide, you know, um, no traffic on the roads, uh, you know, all non-essential, uh, you know, business and industry shut down, you know, no planes in the sky, et cetera. So reductions, um, you know, we're seeing upwards of a 40% of a reduction when we talk about um, nitrogen oxides and PM 2.5 and uh, sulfur dioxide and the last bar is carbon monoxide. Now a couple caveats on it because um, you know we would expect to see some of these reductions anyway just the time of year uh, seasonally we're coming off the heating season and going into the spring so it's a time when we would typically see reductions anyway so there is that in the background and so a lot of the work is also uh, teasing out, you know, what some of the meteorology means um, and, uh, you know, really sort of, you know, parsing out other uh, factors and influences that, that play into this. Um, so what are we seeing? And, and this just gives you some of the ranges, um, you know, that we've seen for the various pollutants. But, you know, again, overall, we're talking about pretty significant reductions when we're talking about, you know, important pollutants like nitrogen dioxide and and black carbon just from, uh, again, linking back to uh, links to public health considerations, whether it's uh, black carbon from a warming perspective and also for uh, respiratory considerations, um, you know, pretty significant reductions. And as I mentioned, um, you know, under normal conditions, we would expect to see improvements anyway, just because uh, seasonality, you know, we typically see uh, reductions uh, this time of year. So um, greatly reduced activity and, you know, uh, that first complicated slide I showed you, in some ways, 
it all just comes down to fossil fuel combustion and evaporation. Now, those are sort of the two processes that, you know, when we when we reduce that, we see um, reductions and improvement. Um, in terms of our air quality and in terms of you know how we advance to achieve our climate change goals. So this um, this data, as I mentioned, is preliminary, and we're we're still conducting you know review and and quality assuring this, and also adding to the data set as we go forward, and also working with our neighboring states and regionally. Um, a lot of dialogue that's been happening to really understand you know what this means from a, an environmental and public health perspective. Um, so. You know, I think moving forward, and I think this is definitely, you know, part of the discussion, you know, uh, we'll get into and I know Charles will touch on it, but some of the things that we've been looking at is, you know, it's, we've kind of laid out a playbook in terms of emission reduction strategies, and, and I, you know, I think one of the things that continues to be forefront in my mind is always, you know, how do you get those multi-pollutant reductions that help to uh, address climate change, improve air quality, and protect public health? Um, the, the work of the GC3 uh, in terms of really looking economy-wide uh, and the intersections. Um, our regional work, whether it's specifically on transportation, a lot of the air quality work is occurring within the Ozone Transport Commission and through NESCOM, which is uh, a, a nonprofit organization, regional organization that represents uh, air quality, works on air quality and climate change issues for all the New England states and includes New York and New Jersey. Um, you know, and a lot of good work that, that has happened and needs to continue uh, across the board in terms of clean energy, clean transportation and sustainable communities. Uh, we recently released an electric vehicle roadmap that I think provides a blueprint for uh, how we look at uh, the transportation sector and then continued work in terms of our clean energy efforts, both in deploying renewable energy advancing energy efficiency and uh, you know one resource I always like to point folks to is our Energize, CT, uh, Energize Connecticut website. Uh, so just to wrap up, I, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on this and so we've produced a series of short videos which I'm going to encourage everyone to take a look at. So I've provided the link which really provides some additional background and additional context and then dives even a bit deeper into some of the, the satellite imagery and how we use satellite data. And then also uh, talks a lot about air, our air quality forecasting and our, our public health messaging around that. And then the other link I've provided is uh, a link to um, the regional research that's been going on. A lot of collaboration that's happening between um, the environmental community and uh, academia uh, to really uh, dive deeper into some of these intersections between um, emissions, air quality, climate change, public health, and um, that link will take you to uh, some of that collaboration is happening if you're interested in learning more about all that content. And I will stop right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, for, I have put the link to the uh, air quality videos um, in the chat. Um, the, I believe, for attendees, Tracy, the, the links on the PowerPoint are not clickable, um, but if you send me the link for that regional research, then I can, less or I can either drop that in the chat or we can put it in the follow-up email to everyone. Thanks so much. All right. Well, our next speaker, let's see if you can, Tracy, and then if you can unshare your screen, that should be an option at the bottom. Thank you so much. All right, so our next speaker is Dr. Mark Mitchell. Um, Dr. Mitchell is Associate Professor of Climate Change, Energy, and Environmental Health Equity at George Mason University. He also chairs the National Medical Association's Council on Medical Legislation and their Commission on Environmental Health. In addition to a medical degree, he holds a master's in public health and is a member of the American College of Preventative Medicine. Dr. Mitchell has spent over 20 years in the public health sector, including as director of health for the city of Hartford, 
and 15 years working with environmental justice communities to prevent and reduce environmentally related diseases and exposure to toxic chemicals. He is the founder and senior policy advisor for the Connecticut Coalition for Environmental Justice. Thank you for joining us, Ted Mitchell. Um, okay. Thank you for inviting me. And I, I do have your PowerPoint here, which I can pull up. I can start showing whenever, whenever you like. Uh, please go ahead and start. All right. So <clears throat> thank, everybody, thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, I really appreciate the uh, <clears throat> people joining during these uh, tumultuous times. I uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, climate and environmental justice in these days of uh, COVID-19. Uh, can we have the first slide? Um, so I think I, I know a number of you are uh, familiar with environmental justice, uh, but I uh, know that some of you um, may not. I know that I saw that um, uh, Lynn Bonnet and, and uh, Henry Lincoln, I know that you're very familiar, but not everybody is familiar with environmental justice. So I thought that I'd start there. Um, so on my first slide, um, I have the EPA uh, definition of environmental justice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, EPA defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people re regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect uh, to um, environmental laws, regulations, and policies that are um, that most impact them. And the next slide. Uh, by fair treatment, they mean that no group of people, um, no matter their racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic group, should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences. <clears throat> um, so basically, that means that no community should be unfairly um, burdened with um, uh, pollution, uh, including uh, air pollution. Next slide. Um, and so environmental justice is seen much more broadly uh, than environmental issues. Um, environmental justice um, is... Uh, the, the reason we come up with this term is because environmental hazards are disproportionately located in low-income communities as well as um, black and latino neighborhoods um, environmental justice is fighting institutional racism that is uh, that the racism is not only in one organization or one thing. Um, uh, so, for example, it's not just uh, uh, healthcare and lack of access uh, to healthcare. Um, it has to do with the fact, uh, again, that um, environmental hazards are disproportionately located in uh, communities of color. Um, you know, if you look at uh, where environmental hazards are placed, um, the greatest predictor is the percentage of people of color, um, more so than um, low income. Uh, but the institutional racism is not only environment, you see that it's also um, criminal justice, it's, it's in all of the um, institutions. So that's what we call it um, actually structural racism uh, when it's um, in, 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 uh, in all of this. There's some background noise, I guess. Um, so the uh, structural, so we, in order to stop um, uh, environmental, uh, in order to achieve environmental justice and to uh, put uh, equity in environment, you have to um, address uh, racism in all of the institutions. You know, so, you know, people were wondering, you know, why would COVID-19 uh, disproportionately affect uh, communities of color. Um, and it's because of this um, uh, structural racism um, uh, that, uh, that the death rates um, in, in uh, African-American communities are uh, two to three times greater uh, in, in a number of states uh, than they are for whites. 
So environmental justice is about stopping environmental injustice and changing environmental policy to reduce uh, health effects. Uh, next, on the next slide is a map of the um, state of Connecticut. Uh, and in the uh, blue shading is a percentage of people of color for uh, each uh, 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 zip code, I'm sorry, uh, each census uh, block group. And the darker uh, the blue, the higher the percentage of people of color. And the yellow dots are the air pollution sources um, in Connecticut. Uh, and so you can see that the air pollution sources are concentrated um, in the communities of color uh, throughout uh, uh, Connecticut. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so when we go, when we talk about climate change, um, the um, Lancet, a prestigious medical journal, the Lancet has declared uh, climate change the greatest public health threat of the 21st century. Um, uh, I also work with the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, and, and uh, which represents more than 60% of, of all uh, physicians in, uh, in the United States. And we also recognize that uh, climate change is uh, a health emergency. Um, it's similar to COVID, which is also a health emergency, but obviously uh, COVID is much more, uh, is much uh, uh, faster uh, in its onset and hopefully much faster in us being able to um, reduce and mitigate the effects of COVID-19. Uh, but uh, uh, what we know is that uh, action to, to reduce uh, climate uh, effects uh, can improve health. Um, many of the uh, greenhouse gases uh, also uh, cause immediate, uh, immediate health effects um, such as asthma um, and um, uh, other uh, diseases uh, such as cancer, and, uh, et cetera. And so we know that as we reduce the greenhouse gas uh, emissions, uh, then we will see immediate health effects. Uh, COVID teaches us that uh, a, a number of lessons that we can use uh, and apply to uh, climate change. Uh, COVID teaches us that we uh, should listen to the experts in order to mitigate the uh, effects uh, of, um, uh, of the disease. Uh, just like uh, uh, climate, we should be listening to uh, the experts. Also, we need to strengthen our public health um, systems, including uh, Tracy, our environmental uh, uh, systems, environmental health system, uh, in order to respond to both the COVID epidemic and to uh, uh, climate change. And equity must be central uh, to both uh, climate action uh, as well as action on COVID. Uh, we need to make health integral uh, to our climate policy making. Um, our vision is for uh, healthy people in healthy places uh, for a healthy community. Um, <clears throat> in environmental justice, we, we refine the, uh, um, we define the environment as the places where we live, work, uh, play, and pray. Um, and we believe that we have to clean, uh, clean up our air um, and our water. Uh, many people are surprised that um, in all surveys that, uh, that the group who is most, in, <clears throat> most concerned about uh, clean air and clean water, and most concerned about um, air pollution and water pollution are African Americans and Latinos. Um, but there haven't been the kinds of opportunities uh, to engage um, uh, communities of color uh, in the solutions. Um, next slide, please. Um, we say that we that um, that it's time to get back to normal, but we say that we must get back to better. Um, 
nor our new normal must be more equitable and we must uh, dismantle uh, structural racism. Uh, next slide. So that's all of my slides. So thank you uh, for your attention and I look forward to your questions and to our discussion. Thank you very much, Mark. I love that get back to better framing. All right. And our next, next and final presenter today uh, is Charles Rothenberger, who will be sharing slides here. Uh, Charles is Save the Sounds in-house climate and energy attorney. Uh, he focuses on climate policy and legislation to ensure clean air and a robust green economy for Connecticut. And with more than 15 years experience working on environmental energy and land issues across the state, Charles is well versed in lobbying before the Connecticut General Assembly, state agencies, as well as municipal boards and commissions. Um, he holds a JD from the Yukon School of Law and a master's in public policy from Trinity College and and is admitted to the Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts bars. Um, so Charles will be talking about some of that, how we get back to better from an environmental standpoint. All right, take it away. Uh, thanks, uh, Laura, and can folks see my slides? Yes. Excellent. 100 days into working from home and I've figured out uh, the system, so. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you for the introduction um, and uh, thank you, Tracy, for the excellent overview of what's been happening to Connecticut's air quality. And we've all participated in, a, I guess we'd call it a forced experiment um, in social distancing and working from home. Uh, and Mark for uh, eloquently uh, and uh, uh, strongly laying out sort of the vision of where we need to be going. Um, you know, we all certainly want the economy to recover quickly. Um, but we should also be cognizant that uh, we really have an opportunity here to achieve this in a sustainable manner. Um, and I think uh, particularly Tracy's slides um, demonstrate that real improvements here are possible. Um, and I think this is a perfect moment to uh, kind of reflect upon and decide what we want the future to look like moving forward, um, which uh, both speakers pointed out um, has significant implications uh, both for the climate as well as for public health, um, which are uh, closely um, linked. You simply can't separate them. And let me see if my buttons will work here. Uh, trying to advance the slides. Ah, I was gonna say it worked during practice, of course. Um, so since much of what's uh, driving the data uh, that Deep's been collecting um, are emissions from the transportation sector, um, I thought it makes sense to spend just a moment looking at that sector, um, recognizing that we really need to address emissions across various sectors of the economy. Um, as you can see here, and probably the uh, circle on the right lays it out most clearly, uh, the transportation sector is uh, far and away uh, the largest sector of our greenhouse gas emissions, um, just a hair over 38%. Um, and if you look at the uh, <clears throat> line, uh, the chart to the left, um, you'll see that uh, really emissions from the transportation sector have remained um, essentially flat um, over the last 30 years um, from 15.6 uh, million metric tons of carbon um, in 1990 um, to just a little bit less, 15.5 in 2017, which is the last year for which we have data. Um, <clears throat> but it's important to recognize that um, that flat uh, emission profile um, has uh, remained constant despite increases in vehicle miles traveled. Um, so people are driving more and further, um, but emissions have not gone up. So that's some good news, but we clearly need to do better if we want to, uh, to bend, that, uh, bend that curve. Um, and also as other sectors of the economy um, have successfully reduced emissions, um, the transportation sector has grown as an overall share um, of, our, uh, of our portfolio. Um, in 1990, transportation represented just 34% of our emissions as opposed to the 38% um, today. Um, 
And you know, there are a range of uh, policy solutions um, that we need to apply here. Um, critical to achieving the necessary uh, reductions from the sector um, is accelerating the transition towards uh, a modern clean transportation system uh, with increased access to um, electric vehicles, um, cleaning and expanding access to public transit options, um, as well as promoting um, different modes uh, of transportation um, uh, entirely. And <clears throat> for some reason, uh, this is spelled correctly on the slides, but whenever it displays, the title is, <laughs> is uh, it, the eyes look like L's for some reason. So um, their eyes on my version. Um, anyways, this is a little bit of a sneak preview. Um, as uh, you may all be aware, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, the General Assembly, uh, the state's legislative body, uh, suspended its operations um, on March 12th, really with no warning. Um, and there were a, uh, a number of bills, um, really uh, excellent bills, pending before various committees of the legislature, which as a result, um, you know, essentially, uh, essentially have died. Um, I highlight them here because um, we will certainly be revisiting these proposals um, in January when the legislature uh, reconvenes. Um, so folks should be aware uh, of these proposals. Um, and uh, SB 10 uh, was a broad uh, climate bill with uh, a couple of uh, great uh, uh, key recommendations. Um, one, uh, it would have codified the governor's call uh, for 100% clean electricity sector um, moving forward. And the key to clean transportation is clean electricity, because um, that's really where we need to go is electrifying the transportation sector. Um, and also part of uh, the key to uh, keeping emissions flat from the transportation sector and improving emissions um, is ensuring that our fleet is as clean as possible. Um, and Connecticut has a long history of adopting California's clean car standards. Um, unfortunately, the administration in Washington um, has uh, targeted those California standards um, for uh, repeal and revision and by uh, extension all of the states that follow them, including Connecticut. Um, the good news is uh, Connecticut and the other uh, states are holding firm. Um, they're challenging the administration's action. And um, another provision of SB 10, which should be highlighted, um, was um, uh, directing DEEP um, to look at California's uh, emission standards for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, and uh, assuming that they meet certain criteria, which they certainly would, uh, regarding uh, environmental and public health benefits um, to take action to adopt those as well. So um, <clears throat> while pushing back against what's happening in Washington, um, pleased to say that Connecticut continues uh, to move forward um, and keep its eyes towards the future. Um, SB 354 is sort of a a companion bill. Um, it um, also uh, would have codified uh, the governor's clean electricity standard, but also set targets for 100% clean electricity in uh, the transportation and the building sector. Um, and also um, had a host uh, of uh, um, recommendations, which I think really get to uh, Mark's uh, uh, environmental justice perspective. Um, one, it would have established a just transi transition office uh, to ensure that uh, the workforce here in Connecticut uh, really benefits from the transition to a clean energy um, economy. Um, that is key. And it would have also established an environmental equity working group um, to ensure that those benefits um, are shared um, equally throughout the state. Um, and then there were a few EV specific bills, um, <clears throat> an act concerning electric vehicle charging stations, um, essentially a right to charge. Um, so if you're not a homeowner, um, if you are uh, live in a condominium um, or perhaps uh, rent, um, it would have uh, laid out uh, criteria and processes by which um, you would uh, be able um, to have access to EV charging. Um, the Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy Program is one of the state's innovative uh, clean energy uh, financing uh, programs, and this would have expanded uh, the range of eligible projects to include um, EV charging infrastructure. Um, you know, one of the uh, big barriers to EVs, um, even as uh, price comes down and range increases is access to charging um, capacity. Um, so that bill would have addressed that. Um, and then likewise, um, uh, regarding 
green building standards, um, another administration initiative, uh, which would allow um, individual towns and cities to adopt um, high performance building standards um, across a range uh, of issues, including uh, promoting uh, EV infrastructure upgrade as part of, uh, part of those building codes. Um, so these are things which uh, are not going away. Um, when we reconvene, uh, we will be addressing them again uh, and certainly hope that uh, everyone who's participating in this call um, will uh, reach out and participate up at the General Assembly as well uh, to support these initiatives because uh, really uh, this is how change happens. Uh, that being said, uh, even though uh, the legislature is no longer in session, um, uh, Tracy and her team at DEEP uh, and the folks over at Dura continue to work really hard. Um, I've highlighted uh, the Connecticut EV Roadmap, uh, which Tracy had mentioned earlier, which really lays out um, uh, a comprehensive view of what needs to be done here in the state of Connecticut to uh, accelerate the transition to EVs. Um, it's not going to be easy. Um, uh, I don't think anyone uh, imagines that. Uh, Several years ago, Connecticut joined uh, eight other states uh, in the multi-state ZEV MOU, uh, which set a target of uh, adopting uh, three and a, essentially three and a half million electric vehicles throughout the region uh, by 2025. Uh, that's five years from now. Uh, Connecticut's share of that target is about 125,000 vehicles, um, and we have about 10,000 vehicles uh, registered in the state EVs. So um, we have a, a steep mountain to climb, um, but fortunately, uh, consumer awareness uh, and outreach and uh, interest um, is expanding rapidly. Um, and to uh, help that, uh, we have a couple financing options here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, so uh, two years ago, uh, we established for the first time a sustainable source of funding uh, for EV purchases through the Cheaper program. Um, that uh, board has been uh, impaneled um, and will hopefully be meeting again sometime this month, uh, but essentially uh, uh, they're in charge of about $3 million a year um, in uh, funds through our greenhouse gas uh, registration fee, um, goes for consumer rebates, uh, the VW settlement program coming out of Dieselgate. Um, there's also a significant amount of money uh, available to the state um, for uh, replacement of current existing uh, diesel engines, um, and that's really more in the, uh, the, the medium and heavy duty um, realm, but if uh, your town is looking at uh, replacing school buses, this is a great opportunity for you. Um, and <clears throat> Tracy mentioned the Governor's Council on Climate Change, uh, on which we serve, um, looking at the progress we've made uh, on the first plan that came out uh, in 2018 and recommending new initiatives. Um, and I know we're uh, running a little bit behind schedule, so I will just quickly uh, summarize the Pura activity. Um, they're also looking through their grid modernization docket about how we can integrate zero emission vehicles into the electricity grid and address uh, barriers, which are sometimes very um, arcane. Uh, like demand charges, uh, which sometimes uh, make it not possible um, for uh, owners um, uh, to adopt zero emission vehicles. Um, so uh, they're deep in the middle of that. Um, but I think there is one pending great opportunity on the horizon um, in the transportation and climate initiative, um, which uh, we will end on here. Um, this is a program that's modeled on the successful regional greenhouse gas initiative, uh, which applies to power plants. Um, and if you look at the map on the left there, um, so those are the participating states, um, 12 states including Connecticut and the District of Columbia. Um, and think back to Tracy's uh, map of uh, the I-95 corridor. So these are the states that are looking uh, to innovative solutions for transportation pollution right where um, those uh, problems are working. So a great opportunity. Um, it's been developed uh, with the uh, state air bureaus of the various agencies um, over the last several years. Um, and the modeling shows that um, not only will this have a significant uh, Im beneficial impact on emissions um, and also public health as a result, um, but there's also going to be uh, a net uh, benefit on the economy as well um, in terms of GDP, income, jobs, um, not 
a, a huge gain, um, but you know, even a small gain over business as usual um, is, uh, is uh, important, particularly when you think about uh, the billions of dollars in public health benefits that come along with that. Um, so uh, states are right now um, in the process of uh, continuing to do their modeling with an expectation of ratification sometime in the fall. So again, this is an area where uh, public input and participation in the process will be critical. Um, polling shows broad support uh, for adoption of TCI um, in the region, but you know, vested interests, um, uh, folks who's, uh, who import uh, motor vehicle fuels into the region um, will definitely be uh, fighting against it. Um, so uh, you all outnumber them. Uh, so uh, I would just encourage you to make your voices uh, heard um, now and uh, moving forward as we approach uh, ratification. Um, and I think um, happy to answer questions on that because I did sort of uh, race through it, but um, I think I will turn over for questions um, from you all. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. You can just unshare your screen. I will try. <laughs> may or may not work. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks very much to all of our speakers. Um, we will be entering our Q&A session. I think because we are um, a little bit behind where I thought we were going to be, um, I'm going to go ahead and give you all the wrap up spiel right now. Um, and then we will go right back into Q and A as soon as I'm after that. So don't, uh, don't hang up when I'm finished talking. That's when it will start getting interesting. Um, so yeah, I just want to thank all of our participants again, um, both our speakers and, and those of you who are going to um, listen and watch and learn today. Um, we will be sending um, all registrants a video of today's program um, within the next week or so and that will also include links to some of the resources and supporting materials that our speakers have mentioned. Um, again our webinars like this one are free and open to the public but they are supported by our members um, and you are um, encouraged if you are uh, so moved and able to uh, help us continue programs like this by giving at safethesound.org. Um, you can also uh, on our website uh, on our Stay Engaged portal, it's www.safetosound.org slash stayengaged. You'll find a full listing of other upcoming uh, virtual opportunities that you can get involved in, and we would love to see you again there. Um, all right, that's the, that's the boring part. We'll get into questions. Um, I'm going to start out with one question uh, from the chat, um, but other folks, if audience members have um, questions that you would like to add, you can either drop them in the chat or you can use the raise your hand function. Again, if you go to chat at the bottom of your screen, you should then see a little, little yellow raise hand icon and you can just hit that and I will see it and be able to call on you, all right? Um, so first, first question we have here is from Judy, and this is an interesting one about sort of the, the limitations of our, um, the limitations of our emissions data. Um, and Judy asks whether Connecticut uh, greenhouse gas emissions data takes into account uh, the consumer consumption of goods that are consumed in Connecticut but uh, manufactured in other states or other parts of the world. Um, and is, do we have a way of accounting for, for Connecticut's uh, emissions impact in that way? I think it's probably a question for Tracy, but there may be a TCI tie in there too. Yeah, I, I guess what I would start by saying is um, we have not moved to, I think really what this gets to is a full life cycle analysis as we think about consumer goods and more broadly, like the whole wells to wheels analysis of, you know, when we think broadly about what we're consuming and emissions that are occurring, you know, uh, in the, in the earliest stages of production, we have not gotten there yet. I mean, I know we've been uh, looking at life cycle analysis and, and beginning to incorporate some elements of it and talking to other states that are also uh, moving in that direction. 
but we have not gotten there. We've, uh, we've looked at um, moving from sort of what I would describe as more a footprint uh, inventory of greenhouse gas emissions, which is so, somewhat where it all started. And you just looked at emissions generated within your jurisdiction and then moved to consumption-based accounting, especially uh, we've done on that in the past several years, uh, especially as we move towards uh, major efforts to decarbonize the grid, where those activities might not be occurring within our state boundaries. So I think we're on the continuum, but we're not quite there. But we have an eye towards that and recognize, you know, that's got to be effective in as we go forward as well. And I will also say um, the Governor's Council on Climate Change, um, the uh, mitigation uh, progress group, uh, particularly the cross sector, um, is working on a recommendation to uh, adopt uh, life cycle analysis in certain discrete instances. I think we're limited um, by a couple of factors, you know, available data. Um, we can't overwhelm uh, the agency um, to, the, to the point where uh, we're not actually making uh, progress on the ground, um, but at the same time, you know, where it did exist in, in particular discrete circumstances where it may make particular sense to uh, factor in a life cycle analysis, not so much for the purposes of our um, greenhouse gas inventory, um, but just sort of we have a sense of uh, those overall impacts uh, will, will probably happen at some point. Thank you. Great, I have a question from Rafe. Thank you, Rafe. Um, all right, Rafe is asking, how do we deal with truck emissions, which I'm guessing make up the bulk of the 40% emissions generated by the transportation sector? So both a, I think probably both a state and federal policy question there. So I'm happy to start on this and then, you know, others should jump in. I, I think it's a great question. I think it's important. I think, you know, I. I feel like, you know, Dr. Mitchell and I have been at the truck thing for a while, and I, I think it's really, really important. And I think it's a variety of strategies that we need to look at, especially um, as we think about diesel emissions, how it impacts our communities, and um, especially our disadvantaged communities in particular that are along uh, transportation corridors. So we've been looking at, you know, how you clean up the existing fleet, but, um, we really have our eye on what California is doing, and Charles talked about Section 1 of SB 10, which really gets to evaluating the California Clean Trucks Program, which, based on what we've seen, is going to far surpass where EPA is going. And I, I see it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity where we have the ability to push really hard and adopt a program that has the most stringent standards um, for the next 40 to 50 years. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's one of the things. I don't think it's the only thing, but I think, you know, um, getting to vehicle turnover and the cleanest options possible has to be part of it. And it really is electrification too, you know, for medium duty and heavy duty um, that, that I think we are looking at and clearly California is looking at. So this is Mark. Um, I think that this is really, really important because this is one of the areas that, that oftentimes we don't uh, look at the equity, uh, look at it through the equity lens and it makes all the difference in the world. Um, uh, but I, I do want to compliment both uh, Deep and particularly the uh, Commissioner uh, Dykes uh, for her efforts to uh, put equity uh, at the forefront of the um, Governor's Council on Climate Change, as well uh, as um, other uh, issues, it, initiatives. So I think that, as Tracy had said, uh, electrification is really going to be really, really important. Uh, and <clears throat> that uh, is particularly important for things like um, school buses, transit buses, and garbage trucks. Um, uh, that we, that when we look at, at how the VW money is spent, that we make sure that it, you know, that, um, uh, that it is proportionally spent uh, to benefit uh, uh, the low-income communities. Uh, so uh, 
other things like uh, like public housing, making sure the public housing isn't built next to uh, highways um, uh, in New Haven. We um, were measuring the amount of um, particulates in the air uh, and um, one of the housing developments, um, uh, Farnham Courts, uh, what, what people were saying was that um, that the asthma was much worse for people uh, on the highway side of the uh, of the housing development uh, than on the other side. Um, so, like I said, there, there are just a, a lot of issues, and then uh, obviously there's active transport. Uh, you know, making sure that that our roads are walkable, bikeable, um, and uh, and and encouraging uh, that to occur. As well as uh, Tracy mentioned, public uh, public transportation. So all of those things uh, are things that can be done to both uh, reduce the uh, emissions from uh, tr uh, from uh, transportation, as well as uh, to encourage uh, health, uh, encourage more um, uh, walking and biking and, and um, uh, uh, you know, really reducing weight loss, or reducing um, uh, diabetes, et cetera. So I'll stop there. Yeah, and um, thinking of the sort of uh, interstate uh, heavy-duty truck traffic, um, I think that's one of the uh, real benefits of uh, TCI, uh, which is a multi-state regional approach, obviously, is that um, as that program sends the appropriate uh, price signals to move away from fossil fuels, um, it's across the entire region. Um, so uh, it's very difficult to avoid the impact of that um, if you're crossing through several jurisdictions. Um, it's going to be consistent across the board. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I think uh, Mark made a, an important point there about um, looking not only at where we, I, 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 think, I think often sort of in the environmental community, when we're talking about environmental justice and, and uh, where neighborhoods are, we're talking, we often tend to talk only about, okay, well, let's make sure we're not citing a new power plant or a new polluting factory or whatever. In a, in a community that's already overburdened. But what we talk about less is if there's housing, if there's new housing being cited in a community, let's make sure it's not being cited in the most polluted part of the community, which is often what happens. Um, and there's, um, that, that, that su suggests that there ne probably needs to be more engagement with local housing boards and zoning from sort of the flip side of that than we often engage with. Right. Yes. Uh, um, you know, people don't have the option of moving if you're in public housing. You can't, uh, you can't move. Um, and uh, actually Farnham Courts um, uh, a, a few years back, I don't know if they're still say that, but it's the only place that I know in the country um, where uh, they ban their residents from having air conditioning. Um, uh, they and they told me that just having a doctor's note isn't good enough uh, to get um, uh, a uh, to get for them to permit you to have air conditioning. Um, you know, they need somebody to verify that those doctor notes are really, really um, important. Uh, I, it, it, I, I've just never, um, you know, I don't know if that's still the case today, but uh, that was the case a few years back. Striking, to say the least. Um, we have a really important question here from Diana. Um, uh, let's see. It says, uh, Dr. Ayanna Jackson recently wrote an article in the Washington Post, which I hope many of us have read, um, about how racism is, is derailing efforts to save the planet. Um, as Dr. Mitchell said, um, uh, in surveys, more black people have shown uh, more concern over climate change than white people have, um, almost uh, 23 million more black Americans. And she asks, and I think this is probably a question, correct me if I'm wrong, Diana, but I think this is probably a question for each of our organizations um, and agencies. Um, how are y'all gonna continue empowering and engaging with black and brown communities so at the table um, and part of the conversation as Connecticut moves towards healthier communities? Um, 
I think maybe if I, I'll answer real quick for, for Save the Sound generally, um, and, and then turn it over to, to each of you, um, which is, yeah, that is, I think that's sort of one of the, one of the biggest questions to ask right now. Um, and part of the answer for us um, is trying to integrate um, the topics of environmental racism and environmental justice and community health impacts um, into the work and conversations that we are um, that we are already doing to make sure that it really stays part of the lens that we are looking at things through long term um, and taking a close look at what kind of events are we hosting, who are we asking to speak at them, um, when are we holding the events, and are we holding them at a variety of times so that um, you know folks of a variety of work schedules can participate. Um, I think certainly, certainly, in some ways, it's fortuitous to um, to be holding a lot of virtual events right now because it gives us a chance to um, experiment with different types of events um, and eliminates some of the barriers in terms of um, who can access events due to transportation and childcare and stuff like that, while adding new ones. You need to participate in a virtual event. You need you know, certain resources and, and high-speed internet and all of that. So um, there's a lot more to learn there for sure. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, the beginning of an answer. Um, I'm wondering, uh, um, Mark, if you wanna speak to organizations that you're involved with, and then maybe we'll go to Tracy and then Charles on, I know the GC3 has been working on this some too. Uh, yes, I'll answer from a couple of <clears throat> points of view. Um, uh, at uh, George Mason, uh, I also think that you know that we're not do doing a good enough uh, job of uh, diversifying our staff. Um, although the organization is fully committed to um, anti-racism, that is not just um, uh, leaving things as they are, but uh, actually trying to change the systems and the structures to, um, uh, to uh, benefit uh, those most impacted and to making sure that the, those most impacted have uh, a voice. So we're doing things um, such as we, we will be hiring more interns. So part of, you know, is a change the, the, uh, the culture of the organization uh, to make it more receptive, um, uh, seeking out uh, the opinions of, of people, but also, um, you know, identifying uh, more uh, diverse um, uh, uh, potent, you know, uh, uh, workers to, to work in in our uh, in our group. And then I also wanted to respond from a community uh, point of view, from a uh, environmental justice point of view. Um, uh, environmental justice organizations receive so little money. It's really, really um, difficult to find uh, funding uh, for environmental justice organizations. Um, in New Haven, there is a, um, uh, as part of our, as far, part of the state environmental justice law, um, when there is an expansion or um, a new um, uh, in, uh, major polluting facility uh, being proposed for an environmental justice neighborhood. Um, they have to uh, have public participation, uh, meaningful public participation uh, through uh, DEEP, uh, but they also need to negotiate with the mayor um, or first selectman of the town uh, about environmental benefits. And uh, uh, and so in New Haven, as well as in Waterbury, they have set up uh, funds uh, for environmental justice. And I think that uh, the DEEP and EPA should be um, uh, using, um, designating uh, penalties uh, from uh, polluting facilities to go into uh, funds like those um, that can be for environmental justice. I think that there should be um, uh, state funding uh, for community um, 
education so that the community can have it, uh, the knowledge. Obviously, this is all very technical, very, um, uh, and, you know, and it takes a while to, to learn about how to have in, input and what uh, the systems are like. So I think that there should be funding for environmental justice organizations, um, including housing and, and other uh, areas. And, um, you know, there's some good models. Um, New York State has the best uh, climate justice law. Um, and I think that we should be looking uh, to learn from each other uh, about uh, policies to, to move forward. Yeah, and I don't have a whole lot to add, but I, I will say, speaking of the uh, efforts underway at the Governor's Council on Climate Change, um, that uh, you know, integrating equity and environmental uh, justice perspective um, into the fabric of the recommendations, um, really so that they're, they're fundamental to each of those, um, has been an emphasis of the work. Um, and I know it's a clear priority for uh, DEEP to ensure that that happens. Um, so hopefully as folks uh, review the final uh, draft. Um, they will see that reflected um, and certainly there will be opportunities for additional uh, public comment um, on that report in the months ahead. So uh, I think uh, more uh, input uh, on that score would certainly be uh, welcome and embraced. So um, I, I'd like to add two additional things that we're, we're working on programmat within our program. And really it's for us, it, out of a discussion, internal discussion we had, we are resource challenged, but uh, my perspective was we need to really get out into the communities more. So uh, one of the things that we're doing, and this goes to Dr. Mitchell's point about facilities, uh, you know, in overburdened communities, we're making sure we're prioritizing inspections of facilities that we haven't been to and making sure we've been to them uh, within a three to five year period at a minimum. So there's an effort underway right now to, uh, we're, we're just uh, getting to the point where uh, maybe we can begin to get people back into the field. That's one complication with this, but we've prioritized that and intend to follow through on it when we can get our folks back out into the field. The second thing I'll preview, and, and this may be a conversation for another day, but uh, I showed you a lot of, um, sort of fancy technology, there's, there's technology that we can use in community. And I think we're looking at ways to deploy that. And we've made an investment to do that. And we're working on bringing a program up that allows us to actually monitor within communities using mobile monitoring. And it can help us identify areas that um, have higher emissions, emiss certain emission profiles. It's We're looking at the full suite of monitoring that would be mobile. Um, and we can bring it around to our communities and are designing a program around that. So there's a lot of discussion and training and work that we're doing right now to invest in that and bring the program up and, and make sure our staff are trained. And I think, you know, I, I see it as a great opportunity for partnership going forward um, because, you know, now, as Dr. Mitchell saying, a lot of it's complicated, but we need to engage and we need to make sure we have boots on the ground and understand what's going on. So it's pretty exciting. Um, and I think, you know, as I said, we're in the stages of developing it and, um, you know, hopefully we'll have more to share on it, um, you know, uh, into the fall. So, but I really getting into the communities and engaging in a very hands-on way, I think is something that's really important. Thank you. All right, I think we are probably reaching, reaching the end of our time. So I see one or two more questions in here. We'll call this the, the final call. If anyone has a remaining question, please use the little hand raisey thing or put that in the chat now. Um, in the meantime, a, a follow-up for you, Mark. Um, uh, are you able to, to speak to what is it about the New York climate justice law that is that it makes it particularly strong and what we what might we learn from that in Connecticut? Um, yeah, certainly. <clears throat> so in, in environmental justice, we define environmental justice and climate justice not only as an end, but also as a process. 
um, <clears throat> that it's important to have uh, those who are most uh, impacted to be part of the decision making around that. So the New York law was uh, developed uh, with those uh, in mind, you know, including uh, workers and you know rural communities, uh, uh, farm uh, farm working uh, communities, um, as well as uh, urban uh, low income uh, communities and communities of color. Uh, there, uh, they also specify that in their mitigation strategies that that the funding for mitigation uh, needs to be. be um, uh, proportional to the population. Uh, so they require that 35% of all of their uh, funding for mitigation uh, benefit uh, uh, impacted communities, low income communities, and communities of color. Whereas for uh, policies that, um, uh, uh, that affect adaptation, uh, the funding processes need to be proportion, proportionate to the problem. Um, uh, so if you have higher levels of, of air pollution, then you need to proportionally um, uh, fund those projects that, that, will, uh, that will proportionally reduce that instead of having like Reggie, uh, which is a cap and trade program uh, where communities uh, could be overlooked and oftentimes low income communities and communities of color are overlooked. Um, uh, I can give you details if you want. Uh, on on that, but I'll I'll leave it there at that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I, I think I could probably see that, that question was from Kurt. So I think um, we would we would love to discuss uh, the New York law and its strengths more with you at some point. Great. All right. Well, I believe that was the final question. Um, if any if any of our panelists have a last quick thought you'd like to share. Please feel free. Well, I, I again want to thank uh, Commissioner Dykes and the governor uh, for including, uh, for focusing on uh, you know, climate justice in this new update. Uh, in previous years, we were not able to contribute uh, as much as we would have liked for a number of reasons. Uh, but I think that that um, uh, you know that the commissioner and the governor are actually uh, do want to hear from uh, climate justice folks, and, and so I want to thank thank all you. And and the Save the Sound is is also uh, been you know out, out re uh, reach, reaching out um, uh, you know always have, but um, uh, I think that there's more uh, effort going on now than there had been. So thank you. Uh, well, I'll just say I think we have a real opportunity at the moment um, that we need to take advantage of. Um, I think with uh, Governor Lamont um, and his administration, um, we probably have one of the strongest uh, climate-oriented administrations we've had in Connecticut in a long time. Um, but, you know, uh, Tracy and her team can't do it alone. Um, I think that uh, folks need to know that all of us have their back and are willing to uh, support them uh, as they move forward um, by providing um, our input and perspective in the development of policies, um, but also letting our local elected officials know um, about the change that we want to see happen, um, because otherwise it won't. And I would just underscore what Charles and Dr. Mitchell said. And if there's anything more we can be doing, please let me know. I absolutely, Commissioner Dykes is committed to this. The governor is. So, you know, it is a wonderful opportunity for partnership and let's move forward as much as we can. Here, here. Thank you so much again, everyone. Um, really, especially appreciate um, both all of our panelists and so many of our um, participants staying longer to continue a really, um, really important and timely discussion. Um, so again, we will be sharing video of this um, sometime probably middle of next week, by, certainly by end of next week. Um, and we'd love to keep in touch with any and all of you at savethesound.org. So thank you again. Tracy Babbage and Dr. Mark Mitchell and Charles Rothberger from our office. And we will call that a day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.